All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to WIO Global Connections. In this special episode, we celebrate International Education Week in conversation with Ambassador Richard Holwell. Ambassador Holwell is here to discuss world affairs and the necessity for international public service. I'm Caroline McCracken Flesher, Director of the Center for Global Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome our audience on behalf of the Global Engagement Office. Together, the four units of global engagement send students around the world. We welcome international students to Wyoming and we build international research opportunities for faculty and students that extend Wyoming's global understanding and reach. If I were to sum up, I'd say, we connect the world to Wyoming and Wyoming to the world. Join us because you never know where you're gonna end up. And that indeed is why we're chatting with Ambassador Holwell today. Let me begin on a practical note before we begin our discussion. Um, because there is a lot to discuss, we ask that audience members pose their questions by using the Q&A function in Zoom. The moderators will share your questions with the ambassador. Please include your email with your question in case we run out of time. And if time does run out, we will do our best to follow up with you after the event. So let me kick off today's discussion by introducing two crucial people and they in turn will introduce Richard Holwell. Uh, for our moderators, I'm very pleased to welcome two colleagues who work tirelessly to launch Wyoming students in the world. First, UW's own Jean Garrison, uh, founding director of the Center for Global Studies and next year, Seibold professor. So congratulations, Dr. Garrison. Uh, Dr. Garrison has been a fellow at the Freie Universität Berlin, has received an international affairs fellowship from the Council on Foreign Relations and has worked in the Office of Chinese and Mongolian Affairs in the US State Department. Her books include Making China Policy, Nixon to G.W. Bush. Also with us, Professor Stephanie Anderson, Chair of the School of Politics, Public Affairs and International Studies. Dr. Anderson's fellowships have ranged from the European Institute at the University of Basel in 2016 to the EU Center in Singapore in 2012. Her recent book, co-authored with Rob Godby, focuses on the economics and politics of the Eurozone crisis. So now, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Garrison, over to you to introduce Ambassador Holwell and to guide our discussion. Well, thank you. It's such a pleasure to have, uh, to have this event and to have Ambassador Holwell with us. Uh, Ambassador Holwell has more than 30 years of experience as a foreign policy professional. He served in a number of policy level positions in the U.S. State Department, including U.S. Ambassador to Ecuador. He was on the team negotiating the Strategic Arms Control Agreement, that is START II with the Soviet Union, and a multilateral treaty banning chemical weapons. Since leaving government, he supported interna the international operations of major U.S. companies and is credited with resolving commercial disputes in China, India, and several other countries. Ambassador Holwell was an advisor on international trade policy to the U.S. Trade Representative and chaired several committees for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. On several occasions, he testified before Congress on international trade issues. He has published two books on public policy and has often contributed to the opinion pages of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other major publications. He is on the board of the American College of National Security Professionals and is an advisor to the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you. Well, you know, um... I just want to reiterate exactly what Stephanie just said and what Dr. McCracken Flesher said, which is it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us in this conversation. And uh, we're, we're anticipating a rather free flowing and honest discussion about how you got into what you're doing, kind of how did you become a diplomat, kind of I'm giving you a heads up to think about that, but then maybe even getting into some substance of some things that you've been involved in over time. So let me just pose this question and then let you run with it. Uh, Ambassador Holwell, uh, you grew up, grew up in Louisiana, I believe. How do you go from Louisiana or wherever you did grow up it, to being uh, you know, an ambassador? Can you give us a little bit of insight into how you got there? And what I mean by that is give us a little bit on your background, you know, a little bit in general. Um, and then 
you know, in a sense, think of it this way. You're, get, you're also thinking about what is, what's some advice you would give people <laughs> in terms of how you get into this work. And maybe it's by telling your story a little bit that we get at that. But that would be where I would, where I would have a start. Well, I, it was Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana, to be specific, which is the northwest corner of the state bordering on Arkansas and Texas. Um, my dad got out of the Army Air Corps at Barksdale Field, which is located there, stayed, and um, married a woman from Louisiana. Um, she, she was instrumental in pushing my sister and me to look more broadly at the world and to look more broadly at opportunities beyond those that we might find in Louisiana or next door in Texas. That was a primary motivation. But I was fortunate in that I had a, an excellent education. I, I went to a Jesuit high school. Um, my finances were such that uh, I went to Louisiana State University and not a school that would have cost my parents a small fortune. My, my mother was a school teacher. My dad was an accountant. Um, and I, I sometimes, and then I got out of uh, LSU in 1968, right in the middle of the Vietnam War. So I, I sometimes jokingly say that Jesuit high school taught me how to think. LSU taught me how to drink and the United States Marine Corps taught me everything I really needed to know. Um, but after the Marine Corps, I came back to the, um, Shreveport for a while, worked then, took a job um, at the University of Missouri and wound up from there as White House correspondent for National Public Radio. I realized early on that I didn't really fit. I didn't really like what I was doing. I began moving and doing other things. Um, wrote a book on the energy crisis. Well, I left NPR and was doing consulting on price control regulations on oil and gas. I wrote a book on why we should get rid of, or an article on why we should get rid of the Department of Energy. Ronald Reagan used it in his campaign and did what I recommended, which was eliminate price controls. That wound up killing my consulting business. And I went to the White House and said, I need work. They said, great, we love you. You can go anywhere except the Department of Energy because they hate you. At LSU, I had a professor of history by the name of Jane de Grumman, who had focused on Central America and the Caribbean for reasons only because I liked her and I enjoyed her classes and I enjoyed what I was learning. I took several courses on that subject. Given my Marine Corps background and um, interest in the area, I decided to ask for a position in the Inter-American Affairs Bureau at the State Department during the Central America Wars. I took that job did better at it than I had at any other thing I'd ever done. To be honest, I had floundered around in Washington trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. And so in my mid thirties, I, I got a job that was a job of a lifetime, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. And um, went through the Central America Wars, went through Iran-Contra, didn't get in trouble, and had some interesting experiences when Jean-Claude Duvalier fell apart in Haiti and I was managing policy. George Shultz decided he liked me. And when the Secretary of State decides to put you up for something, you generally get it. And that's why I became ambassador. I came back a couple of years later to work on arms control issues. And um, that went pretty well. Um, when the administration changed, political appointees were out, on their, out in the street. I wound up consulting. I wound up working for a multinational. I did international government affairs, focusing primarily on market access, trade issues, uh, regulatory reform in many countries, and generally um, used what I had learned through my lifetime to help that country and subsequently other companies solve problems around the world. So it has been a very uh, fulfilling life, but I have a couple of rules for life and, and, um, they're a little bit, um, yeah, unique, quirky, if you will. 
but I've always argued that if you're qualified for a job, it's no fun. And I can tell you, I've had a lot of fun. And then second, I've argued, run to the sound of the guns. If you do a good job in a crisis, you'll get ahead a lot faster than the guy who does an absolutely perfect job in a position that no one cares about. So if I were to evaluate my success, it has been that I've been in the right place at the right time and I've done the right thing. Maybe never perfect, but well enough that I came to the attention of senior people and was moved up. I, um, I'm now retired of sorts. I still consult. I still have a couple of companies that want my advice on things and I enjoy that, but I'd like to be back out in Wyoming and Wilson where I have a, have a place and, um, um, do some hunting and fishing and I'm not going to ski anymore. I tore my leg up pretty badly last year and I've just gone through some surgery to repair a torn hip abductor. And, um, I hope to get that, uh, get that resolved in the near future and get back out to Wyoming. Um, you know, you, you gave us a little hint of the advice you might give people, but would you think a little bit more about that? What, what so you've got, think about some, some who are watching this right now are currently enrolled students at the University of Wyoming. Um, how, it, what advice or suggestions would you give to them if they want a career in the foreign service? Uh, maybe more broadly, we just want to be involved in international work, but, but, Maybe first specifically speak to working in the State Department. What do you do? What what kind of advice do you give them? And you know, maybe say a little bit about the process. Don't come to Washington. I see so many kids come here with um, international affairs degree, maybe a master's degree, maybe even a doctorate, and they flounder around because there are so few positions. They'll go to a trade association or they'll go to a think tank, and they get swallowed up by the swamp. Someone comes in and decides to drain the swamp. We'll take it from a Louisiana boy. When you drain the swamp, you've got to find a place for the alligators to go. I treasure my time in the Marine Corps, even though I did not do international affairs. But in my time at state and as ambassador and um, in doing other things, I saw a cadre of people that I have great respect for. And if I were a young person today looking to do this kind of work, I would approach a military recruiter, primarily the Navy, secondarily the Army or the Air Force. I love the Marine Corps, but they don't offer this particular specialty. Seek a contract to be a foreign area officer. Be a foreign area specialist. You will then go to the world's best language school, which is the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, get the best possible language training, and then either go to the primary uh, overseas location, which is in Stuttgart, or to uh, a U.S. installation overseas, dealing with the various problems that the military has to face just to get its job done. That experience whether it's four years, six years, eight years, will qualify anyone to do a lateral move into State Department once their military contract ends. Um, I say the Navy because I've found Navy, the Office of Naval Intelligence actually, does the best job for strategic intelligence. The Army is looking more at theater and tactical <laughs> intelligence and the Air Force, well, they just wanna know where to drop the bombs. Uh, but these are jobs that, that you can get coming out of college and they can set you up for the next stage of your life like nothing else that I have ever seen. I would recommend that over any kind of entry level job in Washington, D.C. Maybe I can, uh, as a follow up to say, in, we had a conversation last week and you talked a little bit about um, don't be afraid to make a mistake. But I equate that to uh, what you mentioned that maybe you've also said, don't be afraid to take a risk or take a leap. And do you have any examples of, um, you know, where you can you provide an example of, of something like that in, in your own story that then led to that next thing? 
okay? And um, you might have a number of them, but um, maybe kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, there's a term in the Marine Corps, if you're going to take a hit, make sure it's above the waterline, which is to say, if you take a hit in the Naval Service below the water line, the ship is, the ship is going to sink. I've made a lot of mistakes. I sometimes joke and say that to the extent that I'm a somewhat accomplished individual is because I've made so many and I've learned from my mistakes. Um, none jumps immediately to mind. One or two do, but I'd really rather not talk about them. Uh, uh, we had some trying times at State Department when I was there. Uh, a former Marine Corps colleague named Ollie North created certain problems that um, some guys got pulled into, I did not. Um, but um, acting with integrity, acting with the best interest of your superiors, following the rules in the chain of command, these are things that are going to keep you from making the serious mistake from which you will not recover. Um, I, I, I'm hard pressed to give you a case. Well, let me rephrase but, it. Let me rephrase it for you. Because of a Japanese saying, and I that is, failure is the best teacher. Mm. There's, there are his, cases throughout history where generals fought the last war and lost. And we have to be thinking not about the past, but about the future. Um, go ahead and well, rephrase it, and then I, I may come back to some some national errors that I well, have haunted in my life. I'm actually going to turn it over to Dr. Anderson here in a second, but I will rephrase. Uh, what I'm thinking is it from a personal perspective, because when I hear that uh, one has to be kind of ready to step out and maybe take that risk to move ahead, then what you're actually, um, you actually are opening yourself up to the opportunity to succeed, but also the opportunity to maybe not as succeed or, or not succeed in the way you thought. Uh, things maybe don't turn out the way you had anticipated. And so I'm wondering if um, there are certain things that you did that kind of were that leap, that kind of and then moved you forward, maybe in new directions you didn't even anticipate. Um, I, and that's what I would think about. And it's maybe it's not, you know, you. You, you strike me as someone who's not afraid to kind of t make that step because the rewards are great for being willing to make that step. I have a basic rule. When you're new in a job, keep your mouth shut, your eyes and ears open until you're really ready to talk. Mm -hmm. And that has served me well. <clears throat> Let me turn it around a little bit. When I was uh, a deputy assistant secretary, I had officers working for me who would then begin looking for their onward assignment after their two-year or three-year tour working in the department. And I can't tell you how many times I had female officers come to me and say, I really want to go for this particular job, but I'm not qualified. One case study that I remember was a girl that I thought was, was just super. Uh, she said, I'd really like to be political counselor in Buenos Aires, but I'm not qualified. And indeed, she was at a rank one notch below what that job would normally call for. But I said, go for it. If you don't ask, you're not going to get. She got it. She did a great job, subsequently became ambassador three different times because she was such a superstar. But she had to make that that leap, she had to go for the job that was a stretch for her in order to demonstrate to those above her that she was indeed qualified. Uh, there is a book that I've asked my daughters to read. I have two daughters, wonderful girls both, by Cheryl Stanberg called Leaning In. That's exactly what she's saying. Women are often too shy to go for the job that may be above them. And I've never been shy. You might guess. I was always willing to just jump in and go for it. And, you know, occasionally I got it and did pretty well. Um, 
that's a really great note to say to invite um, people who are in the audience to use the Q&A function. And remember that we don't want you to be shy about putting some questions uh, in the Q&A that we can then pose to the ambassador. But maybe I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Anderson for uh, a little bit and for a, a line of questioning she's just ready to, raring to go with here. Well, I, I'm really so happy you brought up imposter syndrome, and I just want to reach out to the to the audience there. So imposter syndrome is when you think, oh, well, that's not for me. I could never do that. That's for someone who's more qualified. And not only does that really affect women, it also affects people from rural areas. It affects people from Wyoming. And if there's a reason why I teach here that gets and Shreveport too, there you go. If, if there's a reason I get up every morning, it's because I am so tired of hearing, I can't do that, I'm from Wyoming. And I just wanted to reiterate what Ambassador Holwell said. Uh, you just got to go out there and try. And I really like the shotgun approach, just apply for, you know, 100 different things and see what comes back. I have to tell you more often than not, you get rejected from the really bad jobs and you actually get accepted to the really fabulous ones or you'll get rejected by a lesser university for grad school, but you'll get into the top one. And uh, there's really no rhyme or reason. So you just have to get out there and, and try it. Also, um, my husband went into the military. I almost did. I'm a real big fan of the Navy. So I was happy for the uh, you know, for, for the thumbs up for, the, for that branch of service. But in case you're, you don't want to join the military, I just wanted to let you know about a few other options out there. There is a critical language scholarship uh, for national security languages, including Chinese and Arabic that are offered at the University of Wyoming. Uh, there's also the Boren, which will also train you uh, in these languages if you're interested. Uh, there are Fulbrights. Um, there are lots of different options out there. Um, there's also the foreign service exam. You may not know this, but all you have to do is be 20 years old. You don't even need a college degree. And if you pass, then you can get in. So uh, that's offered for free once a year. Last I checked, usually in February, I think. But it'd be a good idea to check out uh, careers, uh, state.careers.gov, I believe is the, is the website. Uh, but I was just looking, uh, Ambassador Howell, over your CV, and you've got some like, great, great things on there. Just to just to tell the audience, um, I'm really interested in the Cold War, so I'm, I'm I'd like to know a bit more about your time doing the start um, when you were counselor for arms control and disarm, disarmament, and the demise of the Soviet Union, uh, but also. Uh, you were there and uh, you were Deputy Assistant Secretary for Inter-American Affairs during the, uh, the intervention in Grenada. So you were there at exciting times, uh, also with direct responsibility for Haiti during the fall of Jean-Claude Duvalier. Uh, do you have a particular story or adventure that you'd like to share uh, from your times in, uh, in state? Is there a time that really, I don't know, just a great story you'd like to tell us from the field? Um, I was in El Salvador during the height of the Civil War, and I was supposed to fly from there to Nicaragua the next day. And um, I had gone down to the airport, the control officer was with me, and the flight from San Salvador to Managua was, was delayed. And um, so I sat in the restaurant and started chatting with people and practicing my Spanish and, and uh, hearing stories about things, only to find that the announcement came and the flight left an hour before it had been projected to leave. So I was stuck at the airport. And these guys said, oh, come on, we'll give you a ride. The airport is down at the beach and San Salvador is about 45, 50 kilometers into the hills. Halfway up the mountain, the tire blows and it sounded like a gunshot. So we, uh, we put her into a, uh, an all night truck stop where they're gonna fix the tire. The guy can't fix it. A couple of kids are there with a the truck and they said, oh, we'll take you up to the embassy. Don't worry about it. But I had to ride in the bed of the truck. And they said, one thing, we may be stopped by at a roadblock when the guerrillas go to, ch to collect the people's tax. If that happens, hide under the tarp. 
Um, I stuck my diplomatic passport into my sock and shaped all the way up. But when we got to the embassy, the guard, the Marine guard on duty opens the slide and the armored door looks out, sees me, reaches out, grabs me and pulls me in, comes out with his M16 and points it at the guys in the truck. And I, I, I swear that I thought they were going to die, but I gave them, I gave them each $50 to compensate for the scare. But I always found things like that to be great fun and a lot more fun than sitting around talking to diplomats who are going to say exactly what you expect them to say and not really get anywhere. But sitting that truck stop, I learned more about life in the countryside and among the people in El Salvador than I'd gotten on any embassy cable. And it is, it is so terribly important to really get with people. My biggest problem in Ecuador was I was always in a security bubble. I never really got to talk to people. Um, it was, you know, I had my staff doing that, but I was always talking to officials and I would get whatever nonsense line they were spewing. Understanding the reality of the country you're living in or dealing with is critically important. But you have to be young, you have to be open to experiences, and you have to have very good language skills to get it done. A moment ago when Gene was asking me about mistakes, I flashed on something that had nothing, nothing to do personally, not any personal experience. But I recently read a book about um, Ho Chi Minh and the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. Vietnam was for my generation, a seminal event. And many of us who have that experience go back and try and understand it. What these officers who dealt with Ho were saying was we need not be in opposition to him. Yes, he believed in communism. He believed in the state controlling the commanding heights of the economy, one of Lenin's terms. He nationalized the, uh, the utilities. He did things that, that were contrary to standard thinking in the United States. But above all else, Ho was a nationalist. And what I had not realized going into this was that the French planter class, in, in this case, Vichy French, the French allied with the, allied, with the Axis paid the renegade Japanese troops who were stranded at the end of the war, paid them to recapture South Vietnam. The tragedy of Vietnam is for me magnified by our unwillingness to see reality in a situation like that. My current thinking, if you will, and my, my um, intellectual activities right now focus on Cuba. And understanding Cuba is for me a particular obsession because when you look at US policy, it is a barnacle of the Cold War. It's the best way to describe it. But Cuba policy is in effect hostage to an unresolved civil war. Resolving that civil war requires a dialogue between Miami and Havana that can be facilitated if US policy will be open to it. Probably has to engage, we have probably have to engage the papacy, the papal nuncio in, in Havana and the papal nuncio in Washington, the archbishop in Havana, the, the cardinal in Miami, and generate the kind of truth and reconciliation commission that Pope Francis, an Argentine, knows very well from his experiences in Argentina. Were I conducting policy, I would caution against jumping back to the Obama policies, if only because they must be sustained. And where Trump came in and waged 
you know, tried to cancel everything Obama had done. It is entirely possible that in 2024, the next president will try to cancel everything that Biden does, unless you look at the underlying issue represented by the recognition that this is an unresolved civil war. Anyway, my hobby horse of late. So I've, I've just written an essay on the topic. So um, I think that's fascinating and very insightful. I, I, I agree with what you, you said in your analysis. I think that's a really good way to think about it. And uh, I agree that uh, one thing that, that used to be a given with, with the United States was really a constant foreign policy. Right. It didn't matter if it was Republican or Democrat in power. They were all against, uh, you know, the, the Soviet Union during the Cold War. It was there's really no question about it at all. And now I think uh, the change is so strong. Right. Over the past four years was so strong from uh, from Obama. And then even with uh, with Bush, you have there was more consistency, but there's still change. And I think you're right that in 2024, we could have another complete change. And it's a very interesting for me to think about not a long term U.S. foreign policy, which is what I'm used to studying, and, and Dr. Garrison especially, uh, but to see it as really what do you do in, in a four-year window, it's a completely different way of looking at it. Um, I'd like to invite uh, the audience to please ask any questions, put it in the Q&A, and I'll be glad to forward them on. And in, in the interim, maybe I can pose a question back to please you. Please do. Um, if you're thinking about the this, this kind of the health of the Foreign Service and the America's diplomatic corps. Um, you, one reads about uh, low morale. Uh, certainly, there's been a lot of financial cuts. Um, you know, we have high, essentially hiring freezes in many ways, and this is maybe true across multiple foreign policy bureaucracies or or agencies that deal with foreign policy. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about your your view of where the State Department is now vis-a-vis -vis other institutions. You can talk in the most recent era, but maybe even before that, some of these things are not that new. And um, what do we do to kind of reinvigorate the effort if there is a challenge out there? The State Department, so my experience is the State Department is populated by some of the most incredibly bright, capable, dedicated people I've ever known. I was not a foreign service officer. I was a political appointee, but I, I wound up, when I went up from my embassy, I had support of the Foreign Service Association because they viewed me as a non-career professional, that I had been professional in my handling of foreign policy issues. And I stood up to political appointees, something many of them were a little reluctant to do. Um, when I was working as a, vice president of a multinational that was involved in, uh, in, you know, we operated in 105 jurisdictions. But I took it as a personal uh, quest to try to improve the budget for the State Department. And a, Ron Newman, who runs the Academy of D Diplomacy, organized the group. We had several um, we had two Marine four-star generals and several other flag officers from various services. Uh, the Army calls them general officers, not flag officers. But, but we would go to the Hill and lobby and the military were the most effective advocates. They say, if you don't fund states, you better buy us more bullets. And in um, Jim Mattis's book, Chaos, he talks about that. He talks about telling President Trump, if you don't support the State Department, you better buy me more bullets. And um, it is absolutely uh, the most seriously underfunded department in the US government. And it must be rebuilt. It is understaffed. We have most of our embassies now are operating with charge aid affairs and not with confirmed ambassadors. You would say, why does it make a difference? The host government wants to deal with someone who has been confirmed by the Senate, who has the full faith and trust of the US president. And if you don't have a confirmed ambassador at post, you are suffering mightily. Um, so I, I am a big supporter of State Department. Um, I would, I would never discourage any of you from taking the Foreign Service exam. I would just caution you 
that the oral exam is where most people have a problem because what the examiner is looking for is a degree of sophistication and a degree of detachment that will allow an officer to carry out policies that he might not agree with. I have a young friend in, um, in Jackson who had told me she, she applied for state and bailed out or bombed out at the oral. And I know her well, and I know her political views. And even though she may have been talking to an officer who fully agreed, if she had expressed her political views, she would have been X'd out. The simple reason that they want the officer to be able to subsume his own or her own views to reflect those that are official views of the department and of the administration. Uh, I, I don't know how I got off on that tangent. I apologize, but uh, state is critically important. Well, and, and we've actually got a couple of um, questions and um, maybe I'll pose one of them. And that is that, um, so the question is, um, how difficult is it to create lasting diplomatic progress that will survive presidential transitions? And where do you see US relations going in regard to um, Central America and, and the Americas? The, um, there are a lot of informal um, activities taking place around the big picture. I think President, or President-elect Biden has pretty much decided on key officials. And they are involved in briefing him on the big picture. Most of them have extensive experience in government and probably in touch with people they know in government. Um, I am not aware of their views with regard to the Americas. I've read several articles that uh, purport to say what's going to happen, but um, I wouldn't venture a guess at this point. I, um, I think a very good friend of mine is going to be one of the key people. Um, and at some point I'll talk to him about it. But I want to talk a little bit about Central America since you raised that in particular. We're all aware of the exodus from Central America, the out migration. It is important to look at what is driving that particular phenomenon right now. Notwithstanding the flooding that's taking place as a result of the latest hurricane, there's been a 12 year drought in Honduras. Rising temperatures in Guatemala have allowed a particular fungus known as coffee rust to move upslope and decimate the Guatemalan coffee crop. Now coffee rust can be controlled, but the fungicide to control it is expensive and they can't afford it. These economic or these climate driven changes are creating the kinds of tensions that are forcing people to flee. I contend that climate change is a serious national security problem. It's evident in Central America, but it's also evident in Syria. The civil war there according to Tony Zinni, who was, the, who was President Obama's special envoy for Syria, was sparked by the government's inept handling of a massive drought that occurred in the Sahel, I mean, I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the Levant. And the, the economic crisis for, for the peasants in rural uh, Syria drove the revolution. It is important to recognize that the Sahara is moving into the Sahel and that Central America, Central Africa is suffering a huge climate crisis. That's forcing migration from Africa to Europe. These are national security problems that must be addressed. We cannot afford to ignore the national security implications of climate change and I truly hope that the administration is aware of that and will make 
accommodations to that in foreign policy as they go forward. Now, actually, if you read uh, the defense reviews over time that really go back, you know, a good six to even eight years, and there's a lot of mention in that. You, and some of the, you know, one of the one of the bureaucracies most aware of that is the U.S. military, yeah. <laughs> as seeing it as a contributing triggering factor for a lot of other. Um, sorts of things, but it lends itself to different kind of thinking about foreign policy issues. You know, we think about high versus low policy, high issue, high policy issues being like, you know, guns and bombs and traditional national security sorts of things. What you're talking about is the need to have a pretty adept, uh, a sophisticated view of triggering factors and, and maybe indirect, right, indirect causes of, of certain things. We're used to addressing maybe the refugee crisis. It's understanding the triggers for some of these things that is a, mm -hmm. a very different kind of challenge. It opens it up so it opens up the discussion potentially of what skill set people people involved in foreign policy need to have. I gave a presentation on this at um, the Jackson Hole Center two years ago. Mm -hmm. A couple of people called me later when the New York Times were again writing about it saying we first heard it from you. Gee. So <laughs> But if you stay in touch with your friends in Central America, you will indeed hear about it. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, Dr. Anderson, if it's okay, I'll just pose another audience question. Go right ahead. Of. And that is, it's a little different. You know, we, we do move around a little bit here, but you know, the question is, what are the physical and service qualifications required for the route via military contracting? It depends on the service. Um, mm -hmm. um, Obviously, the Marine Corps is essentially a naval infantry, and everyone in the Marine Corps must be a rifleman first. So the physical requirement in the Marine Corps is a little more strict than it is in the Navy or the Army. But um, I've always felt that any relatively healthy young person should be able to do it. Now, you may have a disability, or there may be some other factor that is that – is, um, important and that may be a an inhibiting factor but give it a shot give it a shot uh look if i can make it through marine corps boot camp you can probably make it through what the the eight weeks the army gives people that's all i can tell you uh, we have another question here uh, given that Christmas is around the corner, I, you know, so we're getting to Christmas season. Do you have any book recommendations of, on international affairs that you would, uh, you'd have our people read? Oh, do I? <laughs> <laughs> you can see my, my, half of my library behind me. Um, a book I think everyone has to read is um, Destined for War. This is by Graham Allison. It is um, an analysis of, of US-China relations. And what he does in this book is draw a parallel, not a parallel, but he creates a paradigm based upon the Peloponnesian War. In the Peloponnesian War, the status quo power was Athens, it was Sparta. The rising power was Athens. And the subsequent war, which was quite costly, was totally unnecessary. He then takes that same paradigm and walks it through history and finds all of the wars that have taken place that follow that paradigm and the ones that did not stand out as well. Um, some people say, why was there a World War I? Well, he puts it in the context of the Peloponnesian War with Great Britain as the status quo power and Germany as the rising power. And reading what he's written here helped me understand a, a war that many people find inexplicable. Um, and then he gets into US China. I've been to China when, a, when I was working for a company that was banned in China. I went there six times a year for eight years running. I've been to almost every province in China. In fact, uh, if you look at some of the medals up there, my great grandfather was the my my yeah great grandfather was the Italian ambassador to Beijing. My uh, 
that's my father's mother's father, grandfather. My father's grandfather was an American diplomat in Beijing. My um, grandfather was born in China. My father was born in China. So I followed China extensively my entire life. And I find this book to be one of the most important I've read. Um, um, I, I recommend it without, without hesitation. I also recommend uh, by Dixie Barthami Freeze, uh, Ho Chi Minh and the OSS. Um, it, it is, I think, the best description of how the U.S. got mired in Vietnam of anything I've read. Um, right now, I am 20 pages away from finishing John Brennan's book about his time as director of the CIA. I am reading it largely because I want to have his take on the, um, the uh, Russian interference in US elections in 2016. Um, eh. Other than that, I would skip the book. Um, I would read Chaos by, by James, uh, James Mattis. I'm waiting for Mattis to publish something about his time in the, in the Trump administration. I felt his book Chaos had great insights into various things that have happened. Um, looking back to see what, what immediately jumps to mind. Um, I read all the time. I, I, I always have and I've always gotten a lot out of it. So um, um, those are the ones that immediately come to mind. They're what I've, those are the ones I'm, I've recently read and I recommend all of them. Thank you very much. Um, I've got one more question. And it regards your comment about the Vietnam War and about how Ho was a nationalist. And uh, I, I completely agree with you. This is something the Americans miss. They just saw him as communist and, and not nationalist. Uh, and so the question is, um, your insight implies that countries always or usually see other countries through their own perspective. To understand Ho's nationalism would have required American diplomats to have seen that country through his eyes. As a general question, is it possible for diplomats to see others' perspectives, the other's worldview? It is critical. I can think of nothing more important than doing so. I have toyed with the idea of developing a course for uh, at a college level, applied history. I know that when I went to Ecuador, I had to read Ecuadorian history as written by Ecuadorans. It didn't make sense for me to read a US history of Ecuador. I had to understand how they viewed their own environment, how they viewed their world and how they got to be where they are, why their obsession about the Amazon is so strong, why it is a country that says Ecuador was, is, and always be an Amazonian country. I had to understand the tuna war with the United States where they captured um, U.S. tuna boats uh, and other things such as that. It was, it was critical to my understanding, but it, it, think for a minute about some of the conflicts that you'll see around the world. Think Indo-Pakistan. Read, um, Freedom at Midnight, the, the history of the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947. Uh, you begin to understand that that tension dating from well before 1947 is at the heart of what might be the next possible nuclear weapons exchange you've got to look at it from their point of view. You've got to get in and read history as they see it. Um, I'm, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm so good. I'm sorry, I'm not meaning to interrupt, but please. I was trying to think of another, uh, another example where I've actually read the history. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, hearing some really valuable things, which is read your history. And yeah. um, I would say that, uh, that, Probably as a people, we do less of that than others, and yet we have our behaviors, our individual behaviors that are highly consequential, particularly in a globalized and interdependent world context. Um, so I want to just make that comment. The other one is that um, I had a professor in graduate school, Paul Kattenberg, 
who was the last foreign service officer uh, who made the, who kind of made a warning early on about you know look at Vietnam and look at this context because he was an East Asian specialist. So there was a again for ideological purposes back in the you know in the the fifties there was a purge of people with that kind of expertise in the U.S. government. So one of the reasons why you miss seeing things is because the people who might have seen it and those who did kind of pipe their head up and say something about it in the Vietnam context, um, who did understand it, they were, they were treated as people who were red communist sympathizers. So I think that that's something to keep in mind that those strains of that that's happened historically and just, just by having certain people in places, that's how you get some of that information um, percolating up. But I wanted to come back with a thread that you mentioned. You mentioned climate change as kind of a key important issue or policy area to deal with. Are there a couple of other big challenges you think we really ought to be paying attention to um, looking forward now? You know, if you were giving, if you, if you had uh, President Biden, elect President elect Biden in the room, uh, what would be a couple of more of those? I assume climate change is one of them. Uh, what it, would be a couple of others? Uh, in truth, um, I was asked this question the last time I spoke at LSU and I wasn't prepared for it. I, off the top of my head, I said exactly what I said to you today. I think the number one challenge we have to face is China. Don't think of China as a rising power. China is here. It's there. It is a equal power today. And they've got a chip on their shoulder because they think in terms of the unequal treaties, the treaties that allowed my father and grandfather to uh, live like kings as a part of the Chinese Imperial Customs Service. Uh, China deserves respect and deserves, uh, we need to say we are equals we will agree to a treaty with you that is equal. But what you do, we'll also do. And if you want to subsidize your industries, if you want to do, if you want to play a mercantile game, beware, we might do the same. You want to control the South China Sea as a Marklausen, which is the legal term for a, for a sea that is uh, not international waters. Well, that could happen to the Gulf of Mexico. That could happen to the what's becoming a Northwest Passage. You don't want to do that. You don't want the Red Sea closed. You don't want Suez becoming a, uh, a no-go zone. You want the Panama Canal to be open to international shipping. And if you close off the South China Sea, you are setting yourself up for that kind of retaliation. Um, but dealing with China is going to be a major problem going forward because their determination to be a world power is not yet modified by a sense of the responsibility they must bear once they have great power. Secondly, we must do more to establish truth. I say that in context of, uh, and I, I mentioned I just finished John Brennan's book, or I'm, I'm 20 pages from finishing John Brennan's book, which gets into Russian meddling in the 2016 election. The efforts by foreign governments to influence US policy and US public opinion through disinformation campaigns is something we must understand and learn to counter. Understand that with regard to Russia, this has been a part of their national strategy going back to Catherine the Great when her chief of staff uh, created his Potemkin villages to make people think Russia was more powerful than it was. It is important to see, understand, and find ways to deal with. We have some people yelling about election fraud, but we need to look both at election fraud and at voter suppression. We need to respect and do everything that we can to protect and enhance our democracy and ensure our democratic values are fully understood and accepted by the American people. 
I won't go further on that because it gets into modern politics and that's probably not what you want right now. But as, as we said earlier, um, I think climate change is something we must address as a national security issue. Use the word trigger. It is a trigger for migration from Central America. It was a trigger for a civil war in Syria that has yet to be resolved. It is a trigger for migration out of uh, the Sahel. The Sahel, I think, means beach in Arabic. It's the southern shore of the, uh, of the Sahara. Um, we must understand how climate creates economic chaos and economic chaos creates tension. And we must find ways to address it. So we've been talking for almost an hour. And uh, I think that is a powerful uh, place to end our discussion today with a really compelling case for why um, our students should be thinking about you know, international service, how important it is, and then many, many areas of that, that service and the many things that drive that service. So I'm going to, um, uh, to our audience, I'm going to say, sadly, you know, our time with Ambassador Hull is drawn to a close. Um, and uh, I'll thank him properly in a moment. To, to the audience, I want to say first, um, uh, thank you for joining us. And if you have a question uh, that you left and has, that has not been answered or one that you have yet to pose, get in touch with the moderators or with me and we'll be very happy to forward that to, uh, to Ambassador Holwell um, or to Education Abroad or whatever Office of Global Engagement um, uh, you would like to, to uh, 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 chat with. So to Ambassador Holwell, <laughs> it's for the faculty team here, for me, for Stephanie Anderson, for Jean Garrison. Uh, we really want to say a profound thank you on behalf of the University of Wyoming and the Center for Global Studies uh, for uh, all the, the help you've given today to U University of Wyoming's faculty and students. You really have opened, I, I was going to say one fascinating window, but many fascinating windows and important windows into um, the possibilities and indeed the necessity of international public service. And we really do hope that this is the first of many conversations that you'll join us again in the future. I know that Dr. Anderson and Dr. Uh, Garrison have ambitions to have you come back and talk with their classes and maybe they'll let us sit in as flies on the wall. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, as in international diplomacy, right? Uh, all the best conversations just produce more great conversations. So to our audience, thank you so much. Um, and to all of us in these very strange times, wherever you are in the world and whatever time it is in the world, uh, we wish you all the best. And we hope to see you again at another Wyo Global Connections conversation.